This is section 102 of Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, a Biography, Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 102 Sketches New and Old. The long delayed book of sketches, contracted for five years before, was issued that autumn. The Jumping Frog, which he had bought from Webb, was included in the volume, also the French translation which Madame Blanc, Teresa Benson, had made for the Revue des Deux Mondes, with Mark Twain's retranslation back into English, a most astonishing performance in its literal rendition of the French idiom. One example will suffice here. It is where the stranger says to Smiley, I don't see no pints about that frog that's any better than any other frog says the french retranslated eh bien i no saw not that that frog had nothing of better than each frog je ne vois pas que cette grenouille est mieux qu'aucune grenouille if that isn't grammar gone to seed then i count myself no judge m t possible that you not it saw not said smiley possible that you you comprehend frogs possible that you not you there comprehend nothing possible that you had of the experience and possible that you not be but an amateur of all manner de toute manière i bet forty dollars that she batter in jumping no matter which frog of the county of calaveras he concluded a number of sketches originally published with the frog also a selection from the memoranda and buffalo express contributions and he put in the story of auntie cord with some matter which had never hitherto appeared true williams illustrated the book but either it furnished him no inspiration or he was allowed too much of another sort for the pictures do not compare with his earlier work. Among the new matter in the book were some fables for good old boys and girls, in which certain wood creatures are supposed to make a scientific excursion into a place at some time occupied by men. It is the most pretentious feature of the book, and in its way about as good as any. Like Gulliver's Travels, its object was satire, but its result is also interest. Clemens was very anxious that Howells should be first to review this volume. He had a superstition that Howells' verdicts were echoed by the lesser reviewers, and that a book was made or damned accordingly, a belief hardly warranted, for the review has seldom been written that meant to any book the difference between success and failure. Howells' review of sketches may be offered as a case in point it was highly commendatory much more so than the notice of the innocents had been or even that of roughing it also more extensive than the latter yet after the initial sale of some twenty thousand copies mainly on the strength of the author's reputation the book made a comparatively poor showing and soon lagged far behind its predecessors we cannot judge of course the taste of that day but it appears now an unattractive, incoherent volume. The pictures were absurdly bad. The sketches were of unequal merit. Many of them are amusing, some of them delightful, but most of them seem ephemeral. If we accept the jumping frog, and possibly a true story, and the latter was altogether out of place in the collection, there is no reason to suppose that any of its contents will escape oblivion. The greater number of the sketches, as Mark Twain himself presently realized and declared, would better have been allowed to die. Howells did, however, take occasion to point out in his review, or at least to suggest, the more serious side of Mark Twain. He particularly called attention to A True Story, which the reviewers, at the time of its publication in the Atlantic, had treated lightly, fearing a lurking joke in it or it may be they had not read it for reviewers are busy people howells spoke of it as the choicest piece of work in the volume and of its 
perfect fidelity to the tragic fact he urged the reader to turn to it again and to read it as a simple dramatic report of reality such as had been equaled by no other american writer it was in this volume of sketches that mark twain first spoke in print concerning copyright showing the absurd injustice of discriminating against literary ownership by statute of limitation he did this in the form of an open petition to congress asking that all property real and personal should be put on the copyright basis its period of ownership limited to a beneficent term of forty-two years generally this was regarded as a joke as in a sense it was but like most of mark twain's jokes it was founded on reason and justice the approval with which it was received by his literary associates led him to still further flights he began a determined crusade for international copyright laws it was a transcendental beginning but it contained the germ of what in the course of time he would be largely instrumental in bringing to a ripe and magnificent conclusion in this first effort he framed a petition to enact laws by which the united states would declare itself to be for right and justice regardless of other nations and become a good example to the world by refusing to pirate the books of any foreign author he wrote to howells urging him to get lowell longfellow holmes whittier and others to sign this petition i will then put a gentlemanly chap under wages and send him personally to every author of distinction in the country and corral the rest of the signatures then i'll have the whole thing lithographed about one thousand copies and move upon the president and congress in person but in the subordinate capacity of the party who is merely the agent of better and wiser men or men whom the country cannot venture to laugh at i will ask the president to recommend the thing in his message and if he should ask me to sit down and frame the paragraph for him i should blush but still i would frame it and then if europe chooses to go on stealing from us we would say with noble enthusiasm american lawmakers do steal but not from foreign authors not from foreign authors if we only had some god in the country's laws instead of being in such a sweat to get him into the constitution it would be better all around the petition never reached congress holmes agreed to sign it with a smile and the comment that governments were not in the habit of setting themselves up as high moral examples except for revenue longfellow also pledged himself as did a few others but if there was any general concurrence in the effort there is no memory of it now clemens abandoned the original idea but remained one of the most persistent and influential advocates of copyright betterment and lived to see the most of his dream fulfilled for the petition concerning copyright term in the united states see sketches new and old for the petition concerning international copyright and related matters see appendix n at the end of last volume end of chapter 102 sketches new and old read by john greenman this is section 103 of mark twain this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography volume 1 part 2 1866 to 1875 chapter 103 atlantic days it was about this period that mark twain began to exhibit openly his more serious side that is to say his advocacy of public reforms his paper on universal suffrage had sounded a first note and his copyright petitions were of the same spirit in later years he used to say that he had always felt it was his mission to teach 
to carry the banner of moral reconstruction, and here, at forty, we find him furnishing evidences of this inclination. In the Atlantic, for October 1875, there was published an unsigned three-page article entitled The Curious Republic of Gondor. In this article was developed the idea that the voting privilege should be estimated not by the individuals, but by their intellectual qualifications. The Republic of Gondor was a utopia, where this plan had been established. It was an odd idea and ingenious. You must understand the Constitution gave every man a vote. Therefore that vote was a vested right and could not be taken away. But the Constitution did not say that certain individuals might not be given two votes or ten. So an amendatory clause was inserted in a quiet way, a clause which authorized the enlargement of the suffrage, in certain cases, to be specified by statute. The victory was complete. The new law was framed and passed. Under it, every citizen, however poor or ignorant, possessed one vote, so universal suffrage still reigned. But if a man possessed a good common school education and no money, he had two votes. A high school education gave him four. If he had property, likewise, to the value of three thousand sacos, he wielded one more vote. For every fifty thousand sacos a man added to his property, he was entitled to another vote. A university education entitled a man to nine votes, even though he owned no property. The author goes on to show the beneficent results of this inaction, how the country was benefited and glorified by this stimulus toward enlightenment and industry. No one ever suspected that Mark Twain was the author of this fable. It contained almost no trace of his usual literary manner. Nevertheless, he wrote it, and only withheld his name, as he did in a few other instances, in the fear that the world might refuse to take him seriously over his own signature or nom de plume. Howells urged him to follow up the Gondor paper, to send some more reports from that model land, but Clemens was engaged in other things by that time, and was not pledged altogether to national reforms. He was writing a skit about a bit of doggerel which was then making nights and days unhappy for many undeserving persons who, in an evil moment, had fallen upon it in some stray newspaper corner. A certain carline had recently adopted the punch system, and posted in its cars, for the information of passengers and conductor, this placard. A blue trip slip for an eight-cent fare, a buff trip slip for a six-cent fare, a pink trip slip for a three cents fare for coupon and transfer punch the tickets noah brooks and isaac bromley were riding downtown one evening on the fourth avenue line when bromley said brooks it's poetry by george it's poetry brooks followed the direction of bromley's finger and read the card of instructions they began perfecting the poetic character of the notice giving it still more of a rhythmic twist and jingle. Arrived at the Tribune office, W. C. Wyckoff, scientific editor, and Moses P. Handy lent intellectual and poetic assistance, with this result. Conductor, when you receive a fare, punch in the presence of the passenger. A blue trip slip for an eight-cent fare, a buff trip slip for a six-cent fare a pink trip slip for a three-cent fare, punch in the presence of the passenger. Chorus. Punch, brothers, punch with care, punch in the presence of the passenger. It was printed, 
and street-car poetry became popular. Different papers had a turn at it, and each usually preceded its own effort with all other examples, as far as perpetrated. Clemens discovered the lines, and on one of their walks recited them to Twitchell. A Literary Nightmare was written a few days later. In it the author tells how the jingle took instant and entire possession of him, and went waltzing through his brain, how, when he had finished his breakfast, he couldn't tell whether he had eaten anything or not, and how, when he went to finish the novel he was writing, and took up his pen, he could only get it to say, Punch in the presence of the passenger. He found relief at last in telling it to his reverend friend, that is, Twitchell, upon whom he unloaded it with sad results. It was an amusing and timely skit, and is worth reading today. Its publication in the Atlantic had the effect of waking up horse-car poetry all over the world. Howells, going to dine at Ernest Longfellow's the day following its appearance, heard his host and Tom Appleton urging each other to punch with care. The Longfellow ladies had it by heart. Boston was devastated by it. At home, Howells' children recited it to him in chorus. The streets were full of it. In Harvard, it became an epidemic. It was transformed into other tongues. Even Swinburne, the musical, is said to have done a French version for the Revue des Deux Mondes. Note, Le Chant du Conducteur. Ayant été payé le conducteur, percera en plein vue du voyageur. Quand il regaut, trois sous un coupon vert. Un coupon jaune pour six sous c'est l'affaire, et pour huit sous c'est un coupon couleur de rose en plein vue du voyageur. Cœur, donc percez soigneusement, mes frères, tout en plein vue des voyageurs, etc. A St. Louis magazine, the Western, found relief in a Latin anthem with this chorus: Pungite fratres, pungite. Pungite cum amore, pungite pro vectore, diligentissime pungite. End of chapter 103, read by John Greenman. This is section 104 of Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 104. Mark Twain and His Wife. Clemens and his wife traveled to Boston for one of those happy foregatherings with the Howellses, which continued at one end of the journey or another for so many years. There was a luncheon with Longfellow at Craigie House, and on the return to Hartford, Clemens reported to Howells how Mrs. Clemens had thrived on the happiness of the visit. Also he confesses his punishment for the usual crimes. I caught it for letting Mrs. Howells bother and bother about her coffee when it was a good deal better than we get at home. I caught it for interrupting Mrs. C at the last moment, and losing her the opportunity to urge you not to forget to send her that manuscript when the printers are done with it. I caught it once more for personating that drunken Colonel James. I caught it for mentioning that Mr. Longfellow's picture was slightly damaged, and when, after a lull in the storm, I confessed, shamefacedly, that I had privately suggested to you that we hadn't any frames, and that if you wouldn't mind hinting to Mr. Houghton, etc., 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 the madam was simply speechless for the space of a minute. Then she said, How could you, youth, the idea of sending Mr. Howells with his sensitive nature upon such a repulsive er 
Oh, Howells won't mind it. You don't know Howells. Howells is a man who... She was gone. But George was the first person she stumbled on in the hall, so she took it out of George. I am glad of that, because it saved the babies. Clemens used to admit at a later date that his education did not advance by leaps and bounds, but gradually, very gradually, and it used to give him a pathetic relief in those after years, when that sweet presence had gone out of his life, to tell the way of it, to confess over fully, perhaps, what a responsibility he had been to her. He used to tell how, for a long time, he concealed his profanity from her, how one morning, when he thought the door was shut between their bedroom and the bathroom, he was in there dressing and shaving, accompanying these, trying things with language intended only for the strictest privacy, how presently, when he discovered a button off the shirt he intended to put on, he hurled it through the window into the yard with appropriate remarks, followed it with another shirt that was in the same condition, and added certain collars and neckties and bathroom requisites, decorating the shrubbery outside where the people were going by to church. How, in this extreme moment, he heard a slight cough and turned to find that the door was open. There was only one door to the bathroom, and he knew he had to pass her. He felt pale and sick and sat down for a few moments to consider. He decided to assume that she was asleep and to walk out and through the room, head up, as if he had nothing on his conscience. He attempted it, but without success. Halfway across the room he heard a voice suddenly repeat his last terrific remark. He turned to see her sitting up in bed, regarding him with a look as withering as she could find in her gentle soul. The humor of it struck him. Livy, he said, did it? sound like that of course it did she said only worse i wanted you to hear just how it sounded livy he said it would pain me to think that when i swear it sounds like that you got the words right livy but you don't know the tune yet he never willingly gave her pain and he adored her and gloried in her dominion his life long. Howells speaks of his beautiful and tender loyalty to her as the most moving quality of his most faithful soul. It was a greater part of him than the love of most men for their wives, and she merited all the worship he could give her, all the devotion, all the implicit obedience, by her surpassing force and beauty of character. She guarded his work sacredly, and reviewing the manuscripts which he was induced to discard, and certain edited manuscripts, one gets a partial idea of what the reading world owes to Olivia Clemens. Of the discarded manuscripts, he seems seldom to have destroyed them. There are a multitude, and among them all scarcely one that is not proof of her sanity and high regard for his literary honor. They are amusing, some of them. They are interesting, some of them. They are strong and virile, some of them. But they are unworthy, most of them, though a number remain unfinished because theme or interest failed. Mark Twain was likely to write not wisely, but too much, piling up hundreds of manuscript pages only because his brain was thronging as with a myriad of fireflies, a swarm of darting, flashing ideas demanding release. As often as not he began writing with only a nebulous idea of what he would propose to do. He would start with a few characters and situations, trusting in Providence to supply material as needed, so he was likely to run ashore any time. As for those other attempts, stories unavailable for one reason or another, he was just as apt to begin those as the better sort, for somehow he could never tell the difference. That is one of the hallmarks of genius, the thing which sharply differentiates genius from talent. Genius is likely to rate a literary disaster as its best work. Talent rarely makes that mistake. 
among the abandoned literary undertakings of these early years of authorship there is the beginning of what was doubtless intended to become a book the second advent a story which opens with a very doubtful miraculous conception in arkansas and leads only to grotesquerie and literary disorder there is another the autobiography of a damn fool a burlesque on family history hopelessly impossible yet he began it with vast enthusiasm and until he allowed her to see the manuscript thought it especially good livy wouldn't have it he said so i gave it up there is another the mysterious chamber strong and fine in conception vividly and intensely interesting the story of a young lover who is accidentally locked behind a secret door in an old castle and cannot announce himself he wanders at last down into subterranean passages beneath the castle and he lives in this isolation for twenty years the question of sustenance was the weak point in the story clemens could invent no way of providing it except by means of a waste or conduit from the kitchen into which scraps of meat bread and other items of garbage were thrown this he thought sufficient but mrs clemens did not highly regard such a literary device clemens could think of no good way to improve upon it so this effort too was consigned to the penal colony a set of pigeonholes kept in his study to howells and others when they came along he would read the discarded yarns and they were delightful enough for such a purpose as delightful as the sketches which every artist has turned face to the wall captain stormfield lay under the ban for many a year though never entirely abandoned this manuscript was even recommended for publication by howells who has since admitted that it would not have done then and indeed in its original primitive nakedness it would hardly have done even in this day of wider toleration it should be said here that there is not the least evidence and the manuscripts are full of evidence that mrs clemens was ever supersensitive or narrow or unliterary in her restraints she became his public as it were and no man ever had a more open-minded clear-headed public than that for mark twain's reputation it would have been better had she exercised her editorial prerogative even more actively if in her love for him and her jealousy of his reputation she had been even more severe she did all that lay in her strength from the beginning to the end and if we dwell upon this phase of their life together it is because it is so large a part of mark twain's literary story on her birthday in the year we are now closing eighteen seventy five he wrote her a letter which conveys an acknowledgment of his debt livy darling six years have gone by since i made my first great success in life and won you and thirty years have passed since providence made preparation for that happy success by sending you into the world every day we live together adds to the security of my confidence that we can never any more wish to be separated than we can imagine a regret that we were ever joined you are dearer to me to-day my child than you were upon the last anniversary of this birthday you were dearer then than you were a year before you have grown more and more dear from the first of those anniversaries and i do not doubt that this precious progression will continue on to the end let us look forward to the coming anniversaries with their age and their gray hairs without fear and without depression trusting and believing that the love we bear each other will be sufficient to make them blessed so with abounding affection for you and our babies 
i hail this day that brings you the matronly grace and dignity of three decades end of chapter one hundred and four mark twain and his wife and end of mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one read by john greenman